1, 6 through 14. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, is this the time when you will restore the kingdom to Israel? He replied, it is not for you to know the times or periods that the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all of Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. When he had said this, as they were watching, he was lifted up and a cloud took him out of their sight. While he was going and they were gazing up toward heaven, suddenly two men in white robes stood by them. They said, men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up toward heaven? This Jesus who has, come, who has been taken up from you to heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey away. When they had entered the city, they went to the room upstairs where they were staying, Peter and John and James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James, son of Alphys, and Simon the Zealot, and Ju Judas, son of James. All of these were constantly devoting themselves to prayer together with certain women, including Mary, the mother of Jesus, as well as his brothers. This is the word of God for the people of God. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you on this Ascension Day for your presence with us even as you were present with the disciples that day on the mount, as you ascended to heaven, may you be present here, and may the promise and touch of your spirit be near and real to us, now and always. We pray it in your name. Amen. In his book, If You Want to Walk on Water, You Have to Get Out of the Boat, Pastor John Ardsberg tells a story, a true story, of a friend of his, it's a fellow by the name of Doug Coe. He's a Christian, been a Christian for quite some time, lives in the Washington, D.C. area. And in his particular church, uh, one of the things he volunteers for is to mentor new Christians. And so there's a young man in his church who be became a new Christian. His name is Bob. And so he met, he's mentoring Bob uh, in this newfound faith. And one day, Bob comes to him all excited. You know how it is when you read the Bible for the first time, or second, third, fourth, fifth time, hundredth time, whatever, there are some unusual sayings and things in there that sometimes can just grab you. And he read a passage that he was all excited about, and so he came to, to uh, uh, Doug, his mentor, and he, Bob said, uh, I read this passage, Jesus says, ask whatever you will in my name, and you shall receive it. He said, Doug, is that really true? Is it really true? And Doug said, well, yes, it's true that God answers prayer. Now, he doesn't answer all prayers in the way we want, but he does answer prayer. Well, Bob said, you know, I've got to do this. I, I really feel led to, to, to seek God and to pray for something. And, and he said, well, what do you have passion for? What's there something you want to pray about? He said, well, I think I want to pray for the the continent of Africa. He said, that's kind of a big topic. You might want to, you know, narrow it down a little bit. Is there, is there one country in Africa that you have some interest in, ministry that's there, or people you know, or whatever it might be? And he said, I can pray for Kenya. I, 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 I have been to Kenya once before, and I have an affinity for that country. I'll pray for Kenya. Okay, that's what he's going to do. So, Doug challenged Bob to pray for Kenya every day for six months. Six months, every day. And he said, I'm going to make you a promise. Now, this is, I don't suggest that you do this, all right? There's a disclaimer here. But Doug said, I'm going to promise you, if you pray every day, you don't skip any days, for six months you pray for Kenya, that God will do something amazing. And if you don't have an answer to your prayers after that six months, if something hasn't happened that's amazing, I will pay you $500. And if God does something amazing, then you owe me $500. They're betting on God. Don't do that. I'm not saying to do that. It's a true story, but don't do that, okay? But Bob began to pray every day for Kenya. 
And after a while, a month or so, nothing had happened. But he was still faithfully praying every day. But he was getting a little bit weary. And one day, he, he was invited to go to a dinner party at a friend's house in the Washington, D.C. area. And he went to the dinner party, and he was seated at a, a table. You know how it is at those dinner parties. You just kind of get put together at random with different people. It just so happened that a lady at the, his table that night was the director of the largest orphanage in what country, can you guess? Kenya, right? So they struck up a conversation. And the lady said, well, I, I, you're interested in Kenya. Why don't you come visit our orphanage and see what we do, see the ministry? We'd love to have you come in the next few months and visit us. And so Bob decided to do that. He made a time in his schedule, and he flew to, to Kenya, and he toured this uh, this this orphanage. And as he toured the orphanage, two things stood out to him. One was the amount of poverty which he saw, which just was hard for someone from the United States to understand if you've not ever seen it. The second one was the lack of, of health care. They had a small clinic at the orphanage that served not only the, the girls and the boys at the orphanage and their staff, but also a lot of the surrounding villages. But there was very little in the way of medicine, very little in, in way of doctors or equipment or anything of that nature. So Bob went home. He's continuing to pray for Kenya. And he gets this idea, the idea that he's going to write and contact every drug company that he can think of. So he writes their reps. He visits some of them who are in the D.C. area as lobbyists. He goes to see them, and he, he asks them if they would consider giving some of their surplus uh, drugs or samples to this orphanage for their clinic. And within just a matter of a, a few weeks, this orphanage receives over a million dollars worth of medical supplies. And they're ecstatic. They just can't believe that they've gotten these medical supplies. So the, the director of the, the orphanage calls Bob in the United States and says, Bob, we're going to have a celebration at the, the orphanage because of, of this great gift that we've received and you, it couldn't happen without you. Will you come and help us celebrate? Sure. So they fly him over to Kenya. He goes to the orphanage. He's there for the celebration. And lo and behold, the keynote speaker at the celebration is the president of the nation of Kenya. Because, again, it's the largest orphanage in the whole, whole country. So he's there. And he, he singles Bob out because he knows what he's done. He knows also his story about prayer. And so he says, Bob, let me take you on a tour. I'll give you a personal tour of Nairobi, of the capital of our country. Can you imagine the president of a country taking you on a tour of their capital? That's kind of amazing. Takes Bob on this tour, and while they're on the tour, they stop their entourage in front of a prison in Nairobi, and in the courtyard in the front of the prison are a group of prisoners, and Bob says, uh, who are those men? And the president says, oh, those are they're political prisoners. They're folks who, who spoke out against the, the government, and they've been thrown into prison. And Bob, without thinking who he's talking to, said, political prisoners, that's not a good idea. You ought to let them go. You don't just say that to the head of the country, do you? But he did. Well, Bob continues, goes home, and a few weeks later, he's continuing to pray for Kenya and for the orphanage and the president and all the rest. He gets a phone call at his job from the US, United States State Department. They say, uh, are you Bob? Yeah. We'd like to thank you. For what? He said, we've been working for almost five years to get some political prisoners in Nairobi released from prison, and we just got word that they were released because you interceded on their behalf. That's crazy. Not the end of the story. About a month later, Bob gets a call from the president of Kenya. He says, Bob, I want you to come to Kenya as my guest. I want you to come. We have, we're trying to restructure the government to be more equitable and fair to our people, so I've fired all of my cabinet. And I'm looking at resumes and beginning to choose people to fill those positions. Would you come and spend three days with me and pray for me as I choose the people who will govern wisely for my country? So here's Bob who has no political connections, who is not anybody 
really. But he's been praying for months for Kenya and been involved now in all these different ways that God has opened doors, going to Kenya to pray for the president as he chooses the leaders of his country. Prayer works, doesn't it? In some crazy and astonishing ways, prayer works. And in just a few days, next Sunday, we will be sharing in probably the most important day in the Christian year. No, it's not Christmas. No, it's not Easter. It's Pentecost, the day when the gift of the Holy Spirit fell upon the church and everything changed. It's Penta, 50, 50 days after Easter. But this event we read about just a moment ago, the Ascension, happened 40 days, 40 days after Easter. What happened in those 10 days in between? What happened in those 10 days in between? Listen to what we read just a moment ago. Before Jesus left, he said to his disciples, Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift that my Father has promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John, that is John the Baptist, baptized you with water for repentance, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit, and you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. So we have Christ saying to his disciples, just wait a while. Wait a while. You, you're, you're saying goodbye to me, but it, it's a good thing. It's not a bad thing because the Spirit, this gift that God has promised, is going to come. So ten days later, the Spirit comes, and these men and women who've been hiding behind doors, who've been afraid of their own shadow because of Jesus' crucifixion, and some of the others of their company who've been been taken into custody, those same fearful people, now it is said in the, in the latter part of the book of Acts that they're turning the world upside down because of this spirit that came. So what happened? What happened during those 10 days? It says that they returned to Jerusalem from a hill called the Mount of Olives, and, and when they arrived, they went upstairs to the room, probably the upper room, uh, where uh, they shared in the Passover feast and the, the Last Supper and all the rest. And all the disciples are listed who are there, along with Mary and some other women. And it says that while they were there for those ten days, they prayed consistently, nonstop, for God's will to be done in them and through them. Ten days. Ten days of prayer. Ten days of preparing to receive this gift that the Father has promised. Ten days when they not only shut out the rest of the world, its, its cares and concerns, but also ten days where they humbled themselves, where they opened themselves up to the, the movement of God's Spirit. They surrendered themselves over to God. They emptied out anything that might be a hindrance to the movement of the Spirit. And Pentecost came because... They were prepared. They were focused. They had one spirit. They were unified by this desire for the Holy Spirit. We're going to watch a, a video right now from a movie called How Do You Know? How Do You Know? And it's uh, two main characters, George and Lisa, are in this particular scene. George and Lisa, you have to understand, both of them have had heartache in their lives, They're things that they counted on, relationships that they thought were going to be everything for them have fallen apart. And now these two persons who've experienced great loss Well, 
Maybe due to our technical difficulties, we're not going to see that. I'll tell you the, the, the gist of it because it's a pretty crazy clip. Um, they're sitting together, and you know how guys, uh, you're, we're supposed to give little nice gifts to women that, that we love and care about. So at dinner, they're sitting with candlelight in the outdoors, and uh, George gives her a gift, beautifully wrapped, and she's very uh, taken by that, very happy that, that he's given her this gift. And so she, she takes a long time, unwraps it. And it's got lots and lots of wrapping paper. Finally gets it open and pulls it out. And ladies, I'm sorry, it's not a great, beautiful gift or jewelry. It is a small container of Play-Doh. And she's looking at this like, see your sound. Okay, what is this? And so she opens it, and it is, does have Play-Doh in it. And she is holding this Play-Doh, and he, said, he tells the story, which I'd never heard, of how Play-Doh came to be. And I don't remember the gentleman's name. It's in the film. But the, the Play-Doh, guy that made Play-Doh, created this in the 1800s as kind of a goo, a white goo, that you would put on the walls to take off the smoke from a coal fire or a wood fire to cook in or to heat a home. And so the smoke would collect on the, the uh, walls of a home or a kitchen, and you take this white goo and you'd push it up there and it would pull that smoke off the wall and out of the crevices and into the Play-Doh, and so it was a, a, cleanser, a cleanser of some kind. Well, lo and behold, obviously, you know, cold and wood fires uh, and stoves kind of went out of style. And so the, there was no more use for this cleanser. And so the, the wife of the man who created the original cleanser said she was a teacher, Imagine that. She said, why don't you put some color, some bright color, a food coloring in the, this paste and uh, let kids just play with it. And I think they'll like it. And so that is how Play-Doh came to be. And he tells her this story and says, see, our lives have both, we've been through disaster. We both had horrible things happen to us. But if something little happens that redirects our life, and can give us purpose and direction, we can be used in for new ways all over again, just like Play-Doh. So the idea is that we can be in God's hands through the gift of the Spirit. We can have a new way of being utilized by, by God if we're ready to receive the gift like these disciples were. So imagine, if you can, the day of Pentecost is approaching. And here are these folks who have been intensely in prayer. They were ready to receive this gift. They were unified to receive this gift. I want to ask you to think in the same way. Do you pray for Wimberley United Methodist Church? Have you been praying for our new pastor that's coming, Pastor Wes and his family, as they prepare to lead you into a, a new day of ministry? Do you seek God's guidance for this church that it can find its purpose and its unity in service of Jesus Christ? Do you pray that you can find your place in the overall plan that God has for this community of the faithful? Now, I'm not talking about praying a frivolous prayer or a selfish prayer. I'm talking about sincere prayer. I want to challenge you to take the, the next few weeks in the, this time of transition to pray for this church, to pray for its mission, to pray for its leadership, and pray for your new pastor. But we're not talking about unrealistic, frivolous prayers. I'm at the tail end of the baby boomers, and we got some more baby boomers out here. I know some of you are, okay? Let me give you an example of a baby boomer prayer, right? Anybody remember a, a lady by the name of Janice Joplin? She's from Texas. She sang a, a song, which I think is really the prayer of every, every uh, baby boomer. It went like this. I remember this song quite well. Oh, Lord, won't you buy me a Mercedes Benz? My friends all drive Porsches. I must make amends. Worked hard all my lifetime. No help from my friends. Oh, Lord, won't you buy me a Mercedes Benz? Remember that? Remember that? That's the prayer of every 
boomer just about, kind of a, a, a selfish little prayer. But I found out it's not just Americans and boomers that pray selfish kind of prayers. A few years ago in Britain, the, the lottery in their country became a big deal. And the BBC found out that people were starting to pray that they were going to win the lottery. So they picked up on this. And they created what the BBC called a lottery prayer, of all things. And it went like this. It's kind of catchy, actually. Lord, I know I'm a sinner, but make me a winner. The lottery prayer. Somehow I don't think that's exactly what prayer was meant to be. Prayer is about humbling ourselves before God. It's about opening ourselves up to, to joining what God is doing in our midst. It's about allowing the power of the Holy Spirit to flow through us. So if we pray intentionally like those disciples of so long ago, what difference will it make? What difference will it make? Well, I'm going to share with you, how about that in preacher ease, three things, right? Three things I think it will do for us as a people. One is it will give us a new purpose. A new purpose for our life. A new purpose for our life. So many people lack a sense of purpose. You know, they, they look like they know what they're doing. They look like success according to world standards. But deep down they're empty. They're hollow. They're like a rudderless ship. They don't know where they're headed or what their life is all about. One of the great preachers of, of uh, our time is a, a woman you may or may, may not have heard of, but most preachers have heard of, is a, a lady by the name of Barbara Brown Taylor. She was just a speaker last week in San Antonio at the Festival of Homiletics. But when she was a young seminarian at Yale Divinity School, she didn't really know what God wanted her to do. She knew she was called by God, but she wasn't sure what that would look like. And she was lonely she was confused, she was afraid, and didn't really know what she should do with her life. And next door to the Divinity School on a hill, there was an old, run-down Victorian mansion, three-story mansion. The roof was beginning to fall off, the windows were all broken, there were boards over the windows, there were signs, do not trespass, everywhere. And on the end of that old building was a metal uh, fire escape that was three stories high with a platform on the top went all the way up to the attic. And so one of Barbara's great fears was a fear of heights. So she decided she'd better face her fears and find out what God wanted her to do. So she climbed up one night up that fire escape very slowly, very gingerly, not looking down because of her fear of heights. She got up to that third floor platform that was swaying gently in the breeze next to that old run-down house, and she began to pray out loud for God to give her direction, to bring her peace, to let her know what she was supposed to do with her life. And as she stood there, she prayed and prayed and prayed, and after a while, nothing happened. And she got angry, to be honest. She said she was angry because God didn't answer her prayer right away. And so then she ran out of words. She began to just simply groan. I don't know if you've ever prayed through something really difficult and got to that place where words are just kind of no longer any good and you just kind of, mm, uh-huh, yep, just kind of groan. She groaned. And while she was doing those groans and got near the end of that time, finally she said it wasn't like a voice that spoke to her. It wasn't some great revelation in the sky. But she knew in the innermost part of her being what it was that she was called to do. She knew that God loved her. It became real inside of her spirit and that God wanted her to do everything she could for the rest of her life to show and share that love with others. Now, that didn't sound profound, but it was for Barbara Brown Taylor. And it gave direction to her to help her to become the great preacher and messenger of hope that she is even now. God wants to give us a sense of purpose. He wants to give us a new sense of purpose to give us courage to live as the people of God. But when we pray intently, it's not only purpose that he wants to give us, but since we're talking about the Holy Spirit, it's also power. It's power. You ever felt powerless? You ever felt like you just don't have what it takes to get something done? 
You know, our biggest problem usually is not, not uh, knowledge of God as disciples. It's not about learning more about the Bible or about uh, spiritual disciplines or those kinds of things. We've got some great teachers in this church and wonderful Sunday school classes, small groups. We praise God for those. Those are great things that help us learn in our heads sometimes, but not always in our hearts. But God says, I want you to have the power, the motivation to do what I have already taught you and called you to do. You can't do it on your own. You can't just add more willpower and somehow make it happen. You have to rely on me. On me. There's a motivational speaker who's from Texas. Some of you have heard of Zig Ziglar, right? Zig Ziglar tells a, a true story of a lady from Dallas where he, he uh, lives. Uh, the lady's name is Althema Arroyo. And Althema Arroyo is a little Hispanic lady about this tall, weighs about 85 pounds. And she was stopped one day at a self-serve gas station in Dallas area getting gas for her car. And a man came up and demanded her purse, wanted to steal it. And she told him no, to leave her alone. And so he jumped in her car and closed the door and told everybody to get out. He's going to steal the car. And so she jumped away from the car. Her two older children who were in the car jumped out. And the man began to pull away from the gas pump with her 18-month-old daughter in the back seat in her car seat. And so Miss Arroyo began, this little woman began to run after the car to grab a hold of the handle on the side of the door and to hold on as the car sped across the, the corner of the lot where the, the gas station was. She, she held on for dear life and she pulled herself literally as the car is moving up to the window of the driver's seat and reached in and began to claw at the face of the man who was trying to drive away her car and take her young daughter at the same time. And eventually this man got so uh, caught up in the attack that he stalled the car. And he got out the passenger side and ran away as quickly as he could, abandoned his desire to steal it. But this little bitty woman had power beyond anything that she had ever imagined she had. Because of the circumstances she was in, she was able to save her daughter, save her car, and drive this man away. The secret of prayer is the way in which you and I can plug in to the source of power of the Holy Spirit. And when that happens, we can do things that we never imagined that we could do because God transforms us through the work of the Holy Spirit. But that's not the last thing. The last thing, and when we pray intentionally and wait for the Spirit's gift to fall upon us, there's one more gift that I think is important. It's the gift of peace. Peace. Remember the words that Jesus spoke to his disciples over in John 14, the last time he was with them before he went to be crucified? We read them at funerals all the time, probably too much. It loses its power when we hear it too much. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give unto you. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Don't let them be afraid. How often do we live out of fear? How often do we make decisions because we're afraid of failure or of some other thing happening, what people will think, what people will do? But Christ promises us when the Spirit comes, we will not only have purpose and power, but we will have peace. Peace that Paul says passes understanding. It doesn't make sense to have peace when terrorists are attacking in, in uh, Manchester. It doesn't make sense to have peace when people are blowing up people of other faiths in Egypt or other places around the world. It doesn't make sense to be able to be at peace when our government and our world is in upheaval. That's why it's peace that passes understanding. Paul says, when the Spirit dwells in you, then you'll have that kind of peace. Not about circumstances outside of ourselves, but it's about God dwelling in us, in our heart of hearts. It's about who we belong to. Who we belong to. 
There was a man who was at 100 years of age named Bernie. And Bernie, like a lot of uh, uh, people that turned that ripe old age of 100, got interviewed by everybody you can imagine. Television stations, newspapers, they want to find out what is it that makes somebody like you tick? What is, how did you live so long? What's your secret? That sort of thing. So they're interviewing Bernie at 100 and saying, tell us some of your earliest memories about your family. And Bernie said, well, I remember at a very young age as a toddler going to visit my great-great-grandmother to be introduced to her for the first time. And he said, I wasn't real thrilled about it. I mean, for one thing, it was, it was a, a Sunday afternoon drive, and it was hot. It was a long ways. And she was old, really old compared to me. And I found out that not only was she old, but she was also blind. And I thought, I don't really want to meet her, but they drug me along. And we got there, and they, my father said, Grandma, here's Bernie. We want you to meet him, the youngest member of our family. And he said they literally had to push me across the room towards this old lady, blind woman, who had gnarled fingers and reached out those fingers and hands towards me, and she looked kind of scary. But I found out when she took me into her arms that she wasn't as scary as she looked. In fact, she was kind of gentle. And because she was blind as she held me in her lap, Bernie said, she began to feel the, the hair on my head. And then she began to put both hands on my, my face and feel the contours of my face and my nose and mouth and all the rest. And he said, then she leaned down to me with tenderness and love and she whispered to me, this boy is one of ours. This boy is part of our family. This one belongs to us. That's what the Holy Spirit does when the Holy Spirit comes to dwell in you and in me. He whispers, probably not whisper, he probably yells at the top of his voice, you are mine. You're a part of God's family. You are chosen. You are precious. You are loved. Nothing in heaven and earth, nothing, no circumstance in this life can separate you from my love. Nothing can defeat you with my power at work in you. That's my prayer. I hope it's your prayer in the next few weeks for this congregation, for its future, for its leadership, that God will come and claim us anew to give us a purpose, to give us his power, to give us peace as we move forward as ministers in the Wimberley Valley. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Now let me invite you to hear this sending forth. Lord, send us out now to be a people who wait upon you in prayer, who believe in the power of prayer and humble ourselves before you, seeking your face so that we might be people who have a purpose and who have power to fulfill that purpose and are at peace with ourselves and with the world around us. Send us out now to be glad and generous-hearted people. Amen.